Listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IoT monetization and innovation in, in different industries with Martin Ectors. My name is Adele, and I work within the community team here at eSynergy Solutions. eSynergy specialize in open source and cloud resourcing. So if you are looking for a new opportunity, we can help you find the right role tailored to your skills and experience on either a contract or permanent basis. Should you be looking to build out your team, we can help you with hiring and attracting top talent. Alongside this, we can also help you with upskilling your employees around the latest open source and cloud technologies. Now moving on to some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Martin, please fire them over via the questions box throughout and he will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. So now I'm going to hand you over to Martin to begin the talk. Thank you. Hi, good uh, afternoon everybody. My name is uh, Martin Ectus. I'm uh, going to try to uh, take over the presenter uh, screen here. So uh, let me know if that is not working. Um, so I'm uh, the VP of IoT Next Generation Networking and Proximity Cloud. It basically means I focus on the next big things uh, for Canonical. You might not necessarily know Canonical. Canonical is the company behind Ubuntu. Uh, we are uh, basic. Uh, we are the um, uh, number one in um, cloud software. So Ubuntu is the number one operating system system for the cloud, but we also have uh, other products uh, and I'll uh, show you a little bit, but this talk is specifically about how to generate revenue uh, with IoT and how disruptors uh, are uh, doing that as we speak and as such, what you need to learn from that to be also successful. So let's uh, dig right in. I wanted to talk uh, Firstly, about uh, some more theoretical stuff, disruptive innovation. It might be a term that's new to you, so let's uh, take a look at like where this has come from. Uh, it used to be that if you studied an MBA, you could like learn about if you introduce a product, it has to be cheaper, better, or you have to go after a niche. You can't have uh, all three, so pick your choice. Then we got something called the innovator's dilemma, in which it said you can have a perfect product, your customers might be very happy with it, but an inferior product can actually creep in and all of a sudden be good enough for your current customers, even if they never asked for it, they all massively switch. And uh, a good example has been, for instance, cloud computing over the years. Nobody wanted to go to cloud computing, it was instant secure, they like were running their own data centers and all of a sudden it became a hype and from one day to the next everybody went to the cloud and everybody that like was selling for uh, data centers had a problem. Uh, a newer thing is called blue ocean strategy. This is all about I take a, uh, an existing offering in the market and I analyze uh, what is expensive and I try to cut uh, back on it. I try to add some new elements. I try to like improve uh, some things and try to target at a new group. A good example of this is Cirque du Soleil, which is uh, a circus that like cut back on um, things like animals, which were extremely expensive. It brought more artists, it made a better tent, and it focused not on children, but it focused on like people that went to high uh, uh, ticket opera uh, things. So all of a sudden they created a market in the circus space that was completely new and none of the existing circuses could go there. The latest, uh, however, in innovation is Big Bang Disruption or BOLD um, and it, it's so new that basically uh, the term hasn't even crystallized but there's multiple groups uh, talking about it and it's the speed at which new things get introduced. You are now able to come in with something that is cheaper, better and more personalized than anything in the market and as such you are able to extremely quickly capture a market 
and uh, change the rules completely for everybody else. Uh, want to see an example? Well, here it is. I might have been a taxi driver uh, that was fine thinking about my retirement until all of a sudden Uber came in and put my whole sector upside down. I didn't know who Uber was. I might not even have known what a data plan was and did, do I need a data plan to talk uh, to Uber and so on and so on. But what I do now know is that like their tariffs are, are, are greatly undercutting mine and I have a problem. So what is driving this disruption? Well, first of all, everybody has now a supercomputer in, the pocket, in their pocket and that has changed a lot of things. Like latest models of mobile phones are multiple times uh, faster than like supercomputers uh, 15 years ago. So um, we are in a luxury situation and we've seen that this has driven a lot of innovation in the last years. Also cloud computing. As a startup, it has never been easier to start up something new. I can just go and rent a computer. If I need 5,000 by Saturday, I can. And there actually have been mobile games that scaled from zero to 5,000 servers in a week. So um, that really changed how software was designed. You might not know this one. This is an Arduino. It's called a microcontroller. It allows everybody to now experience the beauty of building their own product. And uh, I was playing with it the other day with my eight-year-old son, and he followed the instructions, and he was able to make a school project himself. I had to help him a little bit with the program, but the hardware was so easy to assemble that he could do a very nice project and, and got some uh, very good feedback at school. And this is like revolutionizing the hardware industry. Uh, the whole smartwatch uh, revolution uh, started because a company used an Arduino to prototype something and then uh, put it on, on the internet and started this revolution. And in Britain, we even have a bigger revolution uh, going on. The Raspberry Pi, uh, and this is the latest model, the Raspberry Pi Zero. You can easily fit multiple in the palm of your hand. They're extremely small, but don't misjudge the size here. This is a supercomputer. This uh, computer has the same or better specs than the high-end servers companies like Dell were selling in 2001. Now think about like 2001, Google was just small, Facebook wasn't even born, but like you now can for $5, by supercomputers that are more powerful than the first uh, servers Google was using. So this will completely revolutionize. And the other thing is you don't have to buy licenses anymore. There's such great open source software out there that you can just download and get going and make a solution. But also open source is changing things. But it's not only technology that changes, it's also the way that you do things. You can just quickly make a prototype, make a video about it, put it on a crowdfunding platform and get a lot of people to buy it. Pebble wanted to sell a thousand watches for a hundred dollars and already like had uh, their friends down the road in um, Silicon Valley ready to produce that batch of a thousand watches until they were completely surprised that they raised more than 10 million and all of a sudden had to fly uh, in emergency to China to get like professional uh, um, sized of deals set up in a market they had never played in. So that is what can happen with crowdfunding. Now, what are we here for? We're here to talk about IoT. What is IoT? Well, it's a very nascent industry and a lot of people actually have no idea about what is IoT and if you ask the supposed experts, they will give you a different answer. If you would ask an embedded company, they will say that IoT is all about sensors that are now introduced everywhere and they will send whatever they send to the cloud. That's IoT. It's a connected world in which sensors transmit their data to the cloud. But if you ask a cloud company what is IoT, they will say we can take any data from any product and you can like use any interface to control it now. That is IoT. But if you actually step back and look at this, 
you see that there's a problem with this definition. If you would have sensors sending everything they see to the cloud, you have the camera problem. At this moment, we have uh, uh, SD, HD quality cameras, but with the latest smartphones, we have a new chipset called 4K, which is very high quality imaging, and you can also find them in the latest smart TVs. Well, that will find its way very soon, probably this year, in security cameras and webcams. So that means 19 gigabytes per hour will be sent, and it will be very easy to connect uh, any camera and stream it to the cloud. There's only one problem. If we all start to have a couple of those security cameras at home and in our businesses, then any telco in the middle will die because they cannot handle this amount of traffic. And if you think that like Cisco and, uh, and Goldman Sachs are predicting 50 million connected devices and they're all seeing the cloud as like their unlimited storage, you can easily see that there's a data tsunami coming. So if we don't want to go to a world where like networks start to break, we need to go a step further and introduce a new concept called smart devices. What you want to do with this is you don't want to store all this data that is often just noise. You want to interpret and get the metadata out of it. So if I walk into a building or into my house, the only thing I want to have registered is an image of uh, me so that like it can be validated afterwards it was me and some metadata about me entering. I don't need uh, 19 gigabytes an hour type of feeds to be sent. So that's what smart devices can be doing with sensors. Now the other reason why you also want smart devices is that you'll have all these connected things going on. Connected toothbrushes, your webcams, even connected toilets. Well, all these things can share some pretty um, private data with the cloud. And I don't think you want necessarily everybody or unknown people to know this about you. So you need something that like closes those things and just doesn't allow anything to be shared with the cloud. Now I want to do a little test. Can you find the 100 million differences between the new Jeep and the old Jeep? Think about it. What could be the 100 million differences are? I'll give you a clue. In cars, nowadays, you have a hundred million lines of code that you didn't have before. So cars are now some of the most complex things we've, we have that are driving around. Perfect. What can go wrong with a hundred million lines of code? Well, I don't know if you've seen this in the news, but hackers were able to hack this Jeep with a journalist in it and drive it off the road without the journalist being in any stage of like defending himself. Nothing was working, they were in full control of uh, the car. And that can happen with IoT. There will be security bugs that will be critical for them to be patched. So the, for me the news wasn't that like somebody made a bug in 100 million lines of code. There are bugs there. The news was that Jeep had to order 1.6 million owners of Jeeps to bring in their Jeeps very urgently to have a software do, uh, update done. Like in 2016, you still have to have your customer bring physically the product to do an update. That was news to me because remote transactional updates should have been in there. They should have foreseen this. What am I working on? Well, I'm working on an open source uh, version of um, Ubuntu called Snappy Ubuntu Core. It's the first open source uh, operating system that you can just download, put on any type of device, and then put apps on that device, and uh, pretty soon have your own app store for those devices. It allows you to like download uh, badly written apps, even hostile apps that want to attack the operating system, or the other apps, and you can transactionally update and roll back. So if you would put a device on top of the Eiffel Tower 
and like a Raspberry Pi, $5, $35, whatever, and you would update it, rolling it back if an update goes bad can mean the difference between five seconds of work or climbing onto the Eiffel Tower. So why is this app enabling uh, smart devices so interesting? Well, we're preparing for Mobile World Congress later in the week, uh, later in the month, and uh, these are just a couple of pictures from the offices. Like we are having app-enabled networking equipment, mobile base stations, even drones and 3D printers and enterprise networking and so on. Anything can be app-enabled. And if you can put apps on there, you can actually let it do things that are completely different from what you used to do on this device. Because for us, it's just a server on which you put apps. It doesn't care if this is a drone or this is a, a networking or a 3D printer. Now, why would you want to put apps on things? Well, we've worked together with a company called uh, uh, Chill, uh, sorry, First Build, which is owned by GE Appliances, and they brought out the Chill Hub, which is the first uh, uh, app-enabled um, open source uh, fridge. And why do you want to have apps on your fridge? Well, if you have individual sensors in your home, this is what you could do. You could download an I want to lose weight app. And if you would have a smart lock on uh, your fridge that would lock your fridge in the morning until you stand on your Bluetooth enabled scale and based on what comes out of there, your fridge will decide if it opens up the whole day or only during meal times it can help you control yourself uh, with these between uh, meal snacks. And the only way to open it for the whole day would be to go for a run, get to your next Fitbit goal, and then your fridge will open and let you drink uh, whatever you want to drink. And since you've been good, you uh, can uh, have your fridge open. It's just an example of an app. You could do other things uh, with it, but it's an example of how three things that have nothing to do with a fridge together with an app could be combined into a higher level use case that none of the manufacturers of these individual devices actually told about. So who is going to be disrupted in the next years? Well there's also a theory about this one. If you look at like organizations you see a value chain from like low-end things that everybody depends upon like uh, electricity power to like high-level things that like customers want and like are the things that differentiate what the company does. And if you, ma if you then look at like uh, the other thing which is like anything goes to different life cycle. It, it, it gets born, uh, you build custom uh, solutions, then you have products and then uh, it becomes a commodity and so on. Now if you put those value chains and that technology evolution onto a map, you get um, value chain mapping. And in here you can now see that if you bring compute from a product to a commodity, then higher level things happen that weren't there before. You can build platforms as a service, you can have like new things like DevOps and so on come up out of nowhere. So a company that like knows how to make these type of maps can predict the future. Why? Well, these uh, things come from a person called Simon Wortley and I uh, think you should look him up uh, and especially on YouTube you can find his OSCON uh, Keynote 2014 and 2015 videos. He used to be the strategy guy uh, in Canonical uh, uh, before I was uh, doing that and he basically uh, said in 2008 we're never ever ever with Ubuntu going to win in the data center. We can compete with Red Hat and Windows for as long as we want. We're not going to get enough market share. It's going to be very costly. We should win the future. So he told everybody to start optimizing Ubuntu for the cloud. And within 18 months, we jumped from like almost no market share to 70% of market share in the cloud uh, on Amazon. And we've stayed there ever since. 
Uh, famous companies that you might know that are using Ubuntu on the cloud are uh, companies like uh, Uber, Netflix, um, Airbnb, and so on, as well as uh, now for private cloud companies like AT&T and, and Deutsche Telekom and, and others. So uh, this is how by if you know where things are going, you can make a strategy. Now, if people don't know what's going to happen and just look for the next quarter and ask their customers what they want and the customers never tell them uh, they want to go to the cloud until all of a sudden they do and then it's too late to come up with products, you find out what uh, Microsoft and Red Hat found out the hard way that once customers start asking, it's already too late. There is an existing ecosystem on the cloud. Ubuntu is optimized for uh, booting up and stopping uh, servers. Um, and you basically uh, don't find that in uh, regular data centers as such. These existing operating systems don't work as good. Um, this is the title of a Wired article that was published uh, uh, last year called The Walking Dead of um, uh, uh, Walking Dead Tech Companies. And the reason why uh, they were walking dead was that like they didn't uh, jump on the cloud and mobile revolution. So IBM, Oracle, Dell, HP, EMC, and Cisco were mentioned as they missed the cloud completely. Their model is optimized for data centers now with um, everything being cloud and nobody running their own data centers anymore. They are no longer relevant. And Microsoft missed the mobile um, revolution. Uh, it did get into the cloud revolution, but like uh, it's no now no longer the 98% market share uh, operating system it used to be. Um, so who could be next on this list of walking dead candidates? Well, the worrying fact is that it could be anybody. If you don't uh, take care of what you're doing, everybody in every industry could be disrupted. And you can see this, like the list of top companies changes over time. Apple and Google are now the most valuable companies. Ten years ago, they weren't far, like they weren't in any chart. So things can change very quickly. So how can it be that those things change? Well, how do disruptors work? Well, I want to take you to some of the ways that uh, here at Canonical we look at like how to disrupt markets. First of all, we look at like industries that have problems. And what I see a lot now is that a lot of industries have this curve. They're making good money today, but tomorrow they know that their existing revenues will decline and there are certain things happening that like make that they don't control their cost anymore. So I've listed some examples. So telecom, everybody now uses WhatsApp. So you SMS and call less and less. So your, the, the telco revenue goes down. On the other side, Netflix, YouTube, and IoT, as I said before, can provoke a data tsunami. So cost can go up. So if they don't find a new revenue for this, they are going to be having problems. Home appliance vendors, Chinese vendors are coming in. They're driving down uh, the price. So your revenue is going down. And you need to invest more and more and more in new technologies to out-innovate them. So your costs are going up. Retailers, high street sales are falling because of Amazon, but rents are not going down. Investment banks, new regulation, decreasing profitability, but the cost of high frequency trading is going up. And so on and so on. Lots of industries have this problem. And every time we see this uh, pattern, we say, there is a possibility to disrupt. It's an interesting market. Because most of the time these companies can't work with innovators. They create barriers for innovation. First big barrier we see a lot is requests for proposals. Every big company has always processes in place to buy the best solution. What they don't realize is that a request for proposal often kills innovation because it asks for very specific things.
things. And I gave a stupid example here about eating fresh grass, uh, ISO, whatever standard. But like the other day, I was sitting together with a, a family member of mine who had um, invested in a patent to like make a wood drying go from like a full day to minutes. And basically, his patent was worthless because uh, uh, most uh, people couldn't actually use it. Uh, because they were asking, like, I want a normal wood dryer. And then it comes also to the second uh, part. Uh, there were legal barriers that said you need to put 24 hours the wood in, um, in a dryer. Even if it could be done in minutes, sometimes there are these legal things that make things impossible. Then there's also another thing. Most companies are used to defining what their customers want. And they define the products by doing some market study. And they define what will be launched, and it will be this product mix. Well, in an app-enabled world, anybody can now define what they want and how they want it combined. So you no longer can go in and say, like, birds that shoot via catapult is a stupid idea that never will make money. Because perhaps you're wrong. But you shouldn't be the one deciding for your customers. Let your customers decide yourself. And then a lot of small companies can't work with big companies because the first thing they do is like, can you come and install that cloud solution on our mainframes? Well, no, because it, it's not compatible. Or a lot of executives um, uh, thing because they have been doing for 30 years something that it has to be done this way. That's also one of the reasons why innovators can't work. So what happens if an innovator can't work with you? Well, they will work around you. If you can't work and get a product through the whole certification process for healthcare, if you can't offer a healthcare insurance that is competitive and go to capture a lot of market share, and especially this case is for the American market where like lots and lots of people just can't afford the American system anymore. I'm just waiting for that somebody will offer an online service where you will sign an I will not sue agreement in exchange for cheap medical care and get a home kit and talk to some offshore doctors. Yes, it will run into like legal problems, but get enough people signed up and they will call Washington to get laws changed because that's exactly what's happening with Uber. Laws are just a reflection of uh, things that were understood a couple of years ago. But if enough voters like your service, laws can change. And that's a very clear thing to uh, warning to everybody that things, legal barriers can't be innovated around. I want to give you another example. This is about industrial domains. If you hand build very expensive robots for assembly lines, well, be careful. Now we can 3D print those. If you have very expensive uh, controllers, well, now there's open source ones. If you have a lot of solutions to manage the process to, for logistics and manage the people, well, perhaps tomorrow there's nobody actually driving that uh, truck anymore and it will drive itself. So things will change and people uh, that are in the innovation space, if you don't work with them, they will just go around you. And even things as abstract as high frequency trading can be surrounded. Imagine you would have access to all types of like uh, data from live video cameras on the roads, uh, especially here in London. You'd, you could find out which cars and trucks are driving, both uh, seeing like their license plate as well as their brands. And you could also check in like how many times new cars are delivered uh, to different uh, garages that sell new cars and how many new cars are driving out of them. With that, you can actually probably predict better the, the next sales uh, numbers that Toyota will have versus Volkswagen 
uh, and probably with some high degree of certainty weeks before their quarter results are in if you could compare it with historical data. So you could take sales uh, decisions on those stocks and buy them or sell them in very small quantities um, weeks before uh, the actual quarter results come in in such uh, a rhythm that high frequency trading algorithms can't detect that you're actually doing it. As such, you can optimize in completely the other direction that high frequency trading does. Know the future before it happens. IoT can do those type of things. And now an example of like how you could like combine different industries into something completely new. Well, this might look like uh, a Coca-Cola vending machine, but it can actually be an ATM where uh, you can get money. Not a regular ATM, but like to Coca-Cola, it's a cost every time that somebody puts uh, money into the vending machine and they have to go every week to get it out. With cryptocurrencies that are currently uh, becoming very popular, you could go there and exchange digital, digital uh, money for physical money, and as such, Coca-Cola could get a commission uh, for uh, solving their problem instead of cost. The same thing could happen with like mobile base stations. One of the demos we will be doing is like a, a, an open source base station. You could put that in virtually anything. <coughs> Sorry for that. So this vending machine could become a mobile base station and could do a lot more. It can also have a 3D camera and do market research about like all the people that pass by. Uh, together with like um, uh, also the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals that uh, the mobile base station can pick up, it could actually find out who is standing in front of it often by just looking at like signals your mobile uh, presents uh, or looking at like your face and, and comparing it with people on Facebook. So innovators have ways to like make completely new products out of existing things uh, that like you don't expect. So the Ubers of this world are only going to increment. So if you want to launch successful IoT products <coughs> in 2016, what should you do? Well, the first thing I suggest you do is you look at geappliancesfirstbuilt.com. We're working with them and I've been amazed by what they've done. This is a 30 people team that like has a separate building um, next to um, like about 10-15 uh, minutes away from the main GE appliances building in, in Louisville, Kentucky. and Instead of like secretly designing home appliances, they have an open roadmap. Anybody can suggest any problems you have. Anybody can like give ideas for new appliances. You can vote up those ideas. You can vote on features. You can participate in uh, competitions. You can help them even make prototypes. And then it goes to crowdfunding. And if those crowdfunding campaigns are successful, they have a micro factory to produce them. If they're very su su successful, then GE appliance will mass produce them. So if you're traditionally thinking, you would have thought that like launching a $500 ice cube machine for the home is a ridiculous idea. Well, they've asked people and they've proven that by, uh, by last summer selling 2.8 million worth of ice cube machines based on a video and a prototype, there's actually a market for it. So these are the examples and, and, and this has led Indiegogo now to have like a business addition to its crowdfunding campaign to work with companies like uh, GE on like innovating faster. The other thing is what you should do is work with small innovators as partners because the usual incumbent software, hardware and system integrators often have incremental solutions. They come with the same slide deck and now it says IoT, last year it said big data and the years before it said cloud. But it's still the same solution. Whereas innovators are a lot faster in offering like revolutionary solutions. So you should understand what those solutions are and see if they can solve some of your critical problems. And if they can, you should think about like app enabling uh, your products. At IoT, as a feature, 
not as a single product because people don't understand IoT yet. Uh, I've worked with smart home um, appliance vendors that like brought out new products, but people just didn't know why they wanted a smart uh, home uh, gateway in their house. What people do understand is they want a fridge, they want a network equipment, they want um, anything in the office or whatever, and IoT can be a nice feature to that. So if you can app enable things, uh, you can actually let people personalize their um, solutions and create a revenue stream even years after you've sold that device. So it's a lot easier to sell IoT as a feature than as a standalone product. And I'm adding here a point which is very experimental and if you want to know more you should like reach out to me personally uh, because it's, it's very much in its infancy. But uh, I'm looking into like ways of finding out how we can determine what apps run on a fridge, an MI scanner, a tractor, a mobile base station, like what problems would they solve and how could the apps look like. And I think I have some interesting ideas and if you're uh, having uh, some kind of like devices which you say like they could have uh, apps but I don't know what problems and what these apps would look like, reach out to me and we can have a conversation. So, a question I get asked often is, can you innovate in large corporations? Because like you now work in Canonical, which is like a 700 uh, people company, you probably have never innovated in a big corporation uh, like ours. Well, in 2010, I started something called Startups at NSN in Nokia Siemens Networks, which is now called Nokia, um, which was back then a 70,000 people company we were able to get hundreds of ideas that were generated by employees all over the world and we had six groups working on prototypes during two months in Silicon Valley that were flown in from all over the world and they, uh, and they were responsible for creating afterwards four products that were launched the same year. The normal thing was you needed two years for one solution and that solution would normally be like uh, an evolutionary product, not a revolutionary product. And the products were so revolutionary that there's now three independent companies. And in 2010, we already had an IoT big data cloud platform. And now it's an independent company that uh, counts Deutsche Telekom and Telstra, some of the biggest operators in the world, as their customers. There's a cloud communication service that very popular in Africa, and Cloud Street just uh, got in the news because they're working with AT&T. So even in large corporations, you can innovate if you want to. But the reason why a lot of people are not doing it is that they have people that were selected based on their capabilities to grow regular businesses. You have salespeople whose task it is to qualify which customers are of interest and, <coughs> and how to make this quarter's figures. You have marketing that needs to generate leads. You have operational, legal, IT and services that define processes to optimize uh, resource usage to the best uh, the company can. And you have management that focuses on making sure we make our next quarter figures and where are we going. That's the type of people you have in most businesses. But what if you now want to start a completely new business? Nothing that you've done before. How would you do that? Who would you go and ask? Who would be the type of people you need to find in your organization? Well, there's not that much literature about like doing exactly that. But it's something that we need to learn. So from my experience, I would suggest you go and spot customers that have complaints with current products that can't be easily met with a feature. It's a sort of like, my horse is too slow. I would love to go further and longer trips, but like I can't find a horse that is good enough for that. And don't let them define a faster horse, because you need to go and talk to all type of technology experts to see if they have a new technology that you probably have never heard about. They can solve that problem in a new way. And then together with those customers, you need to make a quick and dirty prototype to validate that this is a real solution. And then a very strange thing to do 
is to actually, if you build now a car, you should open source the design. And that's <coughs> a completely new attitude. Because what do you get when you open source? Well, you destroy the market for your competitors. Your competitors will be competing with a free car. Why do you actually want to do that? Well, you want to build a model that like if you work with me as a partner that offers peripheral services and software or hardware, you can like get better. If you compete with me, good luck. I offer a free base platform. So build a scalable commercial model on top, and an app store is a good example, but there's other ways of doing that as well. So what you want to do is you want to have teams that like are very small, very expert in specific domains that are brought together to have like a good mix that like are guided ideally by visionary people, and then you can very quickly test those new, new ideas with salespeople that actually can go out and close deals without there being a real product. And neither the, the like small teams that like do everything type of things, the visionaries or the salespeople that are accustomed to sell without a product, you find a lot in, in uh, big companies because traditionally they're not rewarded. So you might want to go um, and find those people in uh, other markets. And what you shouldn't be doing is, for those new things, focus too much on processes, put a lot of bureaucracy, ask for a lot of business cases. And that last point is also counterintuitive. Because without market validation, any Excel that you make with any business case is a lie. You can make the perfect business case in Excel, but if there's no customer that validates that they actually want to buy it, you just wasted your time. And even that, you can never ever make a scalable business that will generate money from day one. That's depicted here on the side. Scalable businesses are less lucrative in the beginning, but then a lot more lucrative because tripling revenue doesn't mean tripling their resources. That's the ideal of a business. So your business cases will look worse than any incremental business case. And if you just look at like short-term return on investment, you're going to be kicked out every time. But what you actually should focus on is validating what is a scalable business to a critical problem customers have. And that should be your only priority. And why would you care about new business creation? Well, perhaps somebody can open source a solution that is better than yours. Think about what would happen if that happens tomorrow to you. Or people just build around your business, make it completely irrelevant, like what happened with Uber. Or you are protected because you work in a bank a health institution, an energy company, a telecom company, because there's these legal barriers that nobody can like get over. Well, don't be so sure about that one. Or you have a big brand like Kodak. Or you have a big distribution chain that perhaps can fall apart through Amazon. So if you wake up at night thinking, what if the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, Apples and companies would focus on my business. And if your customers are asking about this new startup they heard about or this disruptive technology, what are you going to do with that? Uh, if you see all, any of those signals, you should think about now it's time to start thinking about building up new business creation because my current business might be in danger. So as a summary, Disruptive innovation is about changing the rules of each industry. IoT are sensors, smart devices, and cloud. Secure IoT app stores on devices with transactional upgrade capability are available as open source. You lose the IoT wave, and you could become a walking dead. The best thing that you can do is to collaborate with disruptors because otherwise they will just go around you. And you definitely need to learn 
how to become a new business creator. That was my presentation. If there's any questions, I uh, am ready to answer them. Adele, are you still on the line? Hi there, Martin. Yes, so we have got quite a few questions um, that have been fired in. So I just want um, I pass them over to you. I don't know if you've got the uh, questions box open to to go through. Obviously, there's quite a lot in there. So if you want to sort of uh, do a few <laughs> to start with. Yeah. So how like let me start at home. Yeah. So how reasonable do you think the fear of your private data being leaked is? Well, um, all Facebooks and everybody else in that industry wants is to know how you respond. Netflix would love that you would be wearing a smartwatch that like when, they're watch when you're watching them, uh, all your heartbeat jumps and so on are known to them. So there are a lot of companies that actually want to know a lot of things about you because you're the product. So we already saw that social networks didn't care too much about privacy. Now, they can actually, like the next wave of IoT, can be very intrusive on your body. So privacy um, is a big concern. And uh, there's uh, certain things that, like, as a society, we would definitely have to discuss. Um, so how long do you think domestic IoT technology will be commonplace and reasonably priced? Well, I think it will take still a little bit of time before like everybody will like buy a, a smart fridge and so on. But um, one of the things we are working on is uh, Internet of Toys. And toys are those type of things that like you don't care too much if after three months they don't work anymore. You just buy them because like you just went to see the latest Star Wars movie or Minion movie and like you buy a small robot or a small drone and now it's connected and it does things that like allow you to uh, create a viral effect and so on. So we think those things will come pretty soon. Then the other thing that can come pretty soon is like if you have a broadband modem that now supports uh, next generation supports Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and perhaps Zigbee it could also allow you to, to do things that can be smart meters. So it will come uh, perhaps not massively all at once. Everybody throws away their fridge, but there will be um, a lot of connected devices by December in people's homes, especially for Christmas shopping that weren't there before. Um, there's been a lot of speculation in the media recently about how the most powerful companies don't actually produce products. How far you do, do you think this can go before the bubble bursts? Um, so this one is a very interesting question because cloud has been one of those things that like brought that to um, the attention of Amazon. Amazon used to buy servers from HP and Dell and Lenovo and IBM and so on until they went and opened the boxes and found the same motherboard in all of them. And then they chased who was actually making those things. And they found out that Quanta was the company behind most of those uh, base systems. And the big brands were just buying a computer server from uh, Quanta and putting some custom plastic around it with their logo, putting some extra software on there. Well, what happened? Amazon just went directly to Quanta and found out that by buying from Quanta, they could save, uh, I don't have exact figures, but at least 40%. So what you'll see is that a lot of big companies that have subcontracted things will have a problem because if their ODMs, which is the, the company like uh, Quanta, start uh, selling the hardware by itself uh, with app-enabled uh, software on top, they will lose their uniqueness. So if this is a situation you're in, you should definitely be scared. What will be the risk of any, uh, of uh, sorry, of my more advanced hardware being hacked through connections with IoT-enabled devices? So um, 
we will see hacking happening and especially if like you start rolling your own uh, operating systems and so on because the problem what we've seen after 10 years of doing operating systems is that everybody loves the first month they do it themselves but the problem is three years later down the road that old product that nobody cares about are you still updating it for the latest box the world is full of Wi-Fi products that have bugs in there that can allow remote people to take complete control of your Wi-Fi in your home because the thing has never been updated in the last three years. The good thing for those manufacturers is that those things are not that powerful, but the next generation will be. So the risk, if you don't like work with some of the best in the industry that like the software operating system or even hardware can be hacked is very high so it, this is not something that like you want to be known for because if you think about it if somebody hacks anything that has like even a simple thing as a smart light on it and they start switching it off and on and off 10,000 times a second they might get to a point where that light bulb explodes provokes a fire and kills people and nobody wants to be known as the company that killed through IoT. Um, next question, please can you outline the impact disruptive technology in particular new emerging uh, technologies like blockchain Bitcoin could have on the fintech industry? Well that's a good question. I've been talking uh, at DEF CON 1 uh, last year which is at uh, the Ethereum uh, conference that was organized in London. So for those not familiar with blockchain and Bitcoin, so uh, Bitcoin is a digital currency uh, that allows you to spend money uh, without there being an intermediary. And the reason why that is possible is the blockchain, which is a sort of distributed ledger. Now the next step around uh, that is called Ethereum, which is you can put smart contracts on top of um, the blockchain and if you combine this with IoT you can actually get things like distributed Uber. We are here having some of those experts working on demos with us and basically you can make together with a smart and an Ethereum solution something where like I can rent you something like a car, like a house, you go there with a digital wallet, open the door, for a week and then after that week is done the smart lock doesn't open anymore and automatically the money is transferred. You can do those type of things. Uh, you can like specifically for fintech make banks, make exchanges uh, all, all possible without there being necessarily an exchange or a bank in the middle. The whole example of like the ATM uh, where like it's in a Coca-Cola machine is a good example of how like fintech can be impacted and uh, there's probably some links out there about my talk around IoT uh, at DEF CON 1 that you might want to review there and if you want we can also have a, a private conversation just reach out to me. What will impact, uh, what impact will the IoT have on jobs in 2016 and how can we prepare the workforce? Well, there's this famous thing from BBC saying that like robots will be able to take over a large percentage of jobs uh, by 2000 and I don't remember the exact year if it was 30 or 25 or 35, but you can look it up. So a lot of current jobs can be done by robots and algorithms. So if you're in one of those jobs, uh, you should actually like make sure that you also know about other things because the future will be to make sure that you always catch the next wave. And if you take a look at history, uh, everybody every time that like something new, new comes says like, oh, it will destroy the economy and we will all run out of work. Internet will stop everybody, uh, but like, um, uh, but it will actually also create a lot of new jobs we didn't even exist. Nobody thought that like a social media expert was needed or somebody that could uh, do UX design, a DevOp or a big data uh, analyst. Those are new things that have been just created a couple of years ago. So what you need to do is to make sure that like new skill sets are always uh, on your mind. 
Security seems like the biggest concern with IoT at this point. How challenging do you think it will be trying to secure every single device connected to the internet? Well, security is critical because if you can control uh, things like a nuclear plant, imagine what can go wrong. Um, how difficult? It's <coughs> it's basically a, a top priority for everybody doing um, things and like there's a lot of things that we personally look into so Ubuntu traditionally by uh, the British Security um, Agency has been uh, uh, like publicly stated as the most secure general purpose operating system uh, year after year. And the reason why that is is because we basically take security as the basis like you need to assume that people want to abuse. If you make software with the idea that like uh, we'll think afterwards, then it's going to end very badly. So uh, security, there are going to be problems. There were already big problems. The other day there was somebody's baby cam that was hacked and in the middle of the night somebody would wake up uh, a young boy, talk very bad things to that young boy and that young boy would complain in the morning to parents that like somebody was phoning up in the night and it was only by pure coincidence that the mother walked in when it happened one day that she found out. So like even something as stupid as a baby monitor needs to be secure. So that's why I, I'm telling you like don't cut corners on that one. How do you make sure your IoT technology product doesn't become the next mini disk? Well, don't make a solution and then find a problem. Find a problem, validate that people think it's critical and are willing to spend money, validate that your solution is the solution for their problem, and then it will not become a next mini disk. Next mini disk you get if you make a solution and then see if somebody wants to buy it. Now, in the age of crowdfunding, you should actually think, could I crowdfund it? Could I do things in which I validate it before I bring it in mass to the market? What change brought on by IoT are you looking forward to the most? Well, I want to see like real app stores everywhere because like it has such it has been such an wonderful experience to like know that you're working on something that like can change people's life for good. So I want to see those apps that like are the angry birds of IoT. That is the type of thing that like uh, I would have an I told you so moment. So that is where like I'm, I'm really like trying to think about like what is the angry bird of IoT. So I think those are the questions. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, a lot for assisting and, and taking an hour of your time. I want to also thank a lot uh, eSynergy. So if you think you don't have the right uh, people in your company to start new businesses and you need more disruptors, uh, they're a good place to go and talk. Thank you very much.